Thanks, Carrie Ann. Thanks for having me. I, I was, I, I had never been to the print studio here at, at the Academy until this year, and uh, I, it's such an amazing setup. You guys are really lucky. I've seen a lot of university print studios uh, around the country, and I can say this is one of the best, and I really respect Carrie Ann's work, and thank you very much. You guys, you've got great equipment and super facilities, and it's awesome. Uh, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. Um, I was going over my slides last night, uh, not slides, I have like a PowerPoint presentation that I just sort of dumped. And I thought, well, I'm just going to show some stuff off of my Instagram feed <laughs> and tell stories. And then, but the, uh, it's not going to really work out uh, so easily uh, because I thought I'd be sitting up here with my computer. And, uh, but I'm going to be in front and back and front and back. <laughs> and talking as I go along. So um, uh, what, what I have here is uh, these, these are etchings. Anyway, as Carrie Ann said, I have my own studio. I was trained as a master printer at Crown Point Press, which is up the street from here on Hawthorne. And they publish etchings, uh, fine art prints primarily from leading contemporary artists. And so there are master printers in the studio, usually three or four are there all the time. An artist comes in and they work intensively for like two weeks making plates, etching plates, etching on copper, you know, intaglio, old school stuff. And so artists like, well, back in the day when I was there, Richard Diebenkorn, Wayne Thiebaud. Wayne Thiebaud's still alive. I worked with him uh, about a month ago. He's 95. He's an amazing. He's been making prints for 50 years. So uh, John Cage, Francesco Clemente, I've just n named a bunch of men. Uh, Judy Pfaff, who's a well-known sculptor. Um, I'm not blanking on the women. I'm just, I don't, I'm just trying to figure out some of the artists I worked with. But anyway, so I, I learned that. And so the artists come in, right? And they work, with the, they work with the printers. You're not making reproductions. They don't bring like a digital image and they say, okay, we're going to make a four color separation and make posters. We prepare the copper plates in the traditional manner, like hard ground, soft ground, aqua tint. And we give the artists the plates. They draw on them. They paint on them. They scratch them. We print them. We proof them. And you proof and proof and proof for two weeks, get the colors all straight, they sign it OK, they go away, we addition them for several months, and then the publisher sells them and splits, splits the proceeds like royalties with the artist. So anyway, that's what I was trained to do, right? So then I went on to Japan and started my own studio, and then I came back here, and I had a studio in Hawaii, and I came back here, and now I'm teaching in Portland. But I work with artists in this manner, so I've, and now I work with a lot of contemporary artists, tattoo artists, primarily right now. But this is my own work. This, um, I wanted to throw this up because this is like the only slideshow I kind of had ready to go that could just go through while I was able to talk. But anyway, these are, these are etchings. Um, they're about this big, and there are 80 of them for a show I did in Hawaii at the Honolulu Printmakers. So I, the techniques and why I'm here today to do a demonstration later, the techniques I use are a lot of to do with uh, working with Asian papers, specifically Japanese papers, but also Chinese and Korean papers. So very thin, handmade, mulberry, gompi, mitsumata, um, and silk. And I print on those. So all of these have some like silk substrate. And then these are photogravures. So I do a lot of photogravure, which is a 19th century process that involves transferring continuous tone images to copper plates. And the, and the process hasn't changed since the 1860s. It's really beautiful. And so I make these gravure plates, and then I scratch into them. And I made this series of 80 prints based on Japanese no masks, based on these little traditional demons that um, come out of Buddhism. This is like a really old devil. Um, the Hanya mask, which is popular in tattooing. And so all these layers printed on silk and um, imagery, imagery coming out of, out of uh, like I said, Japanese no theater, kabuki theater, tattoo imagery. And then, then I take these gravure plates and I print them. 
and then I scratch them by throwing them on the, on the street and stomping on them, and then I throw them back in the acid, and I etch them further, so, and I keep printing them and printing them and printing them, so I don't addition. I spend my professional life additioning for other artists, so in my work, I usually just do one-offs, and I uh, sort of, uh, so the plate disintegrates throughout the additioning process. So they're like, well, it was an addition of 80, but I, with proofs, I think there were 108 of these, and they're all different, all completely different, out of about 24 source plates. Um, and I use a lot of gold leaf and gold mica dust and, and antique gold, uh, gold leaf that I, I work with scroll mounters in Japan and they, in Japan when they redo those big beautiful folding screens that are gold leaf, um, every 50 or 100 years they have to read, they have to redo those and they take all the, all the paper off and they keep the guts of the screen and they like redo it, they remount it, and my scroll mounter, I don't know why I hit pause all of a sudden, that's crazy, oh it's probably at the end of the show, anyway so my scroll mounter gives me these big sheets of like gold leaf um, and I print on them and stuff. It stopped at a good time maybe, oh yeah just hit the play button, let's see what else comes up. So I want to, I didn't want to, I want to talk a little bit about what I do with other artists, so that's what I'm going to go back here, and you're not going to see me for a little bit. <laughs> and um, how many printmakers in the audience, all the ones in the front two rows? <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, and the rest of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Intaglio printing on copper, right? Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, hasn't changed since uh, Durer. You know Durer? Alprecht Durer, woodcuts, engraving on copper in the 1500s. Now it's 2007, what year is it? 2015. <laughs> it's kind of cool to be still doing this process and like this is a photogravure process. Uh, you know, uh, any photographers in the room? You know Stieglitz, camera work, you know the, all the work that was done out of the, uh, around the turn of the century when they started producing camera work, all that was done on copper plates using photogravure that they sussed out in the 1860s, literally. It was the first way to repro mechanically reproduce images, but it's not, it doesn't have a half-tone screen like we use now, or now we have digital, that's different, but so the half-tone screen gives the illusion of continuous tone, depending on how big the dots are or how small and how far or close they are to each other in relation to each other, but gravure is actually continuous tone. So you look at it with a loop and you can't, you can't see a dot pattern. And it's really beautiful because the process literally hasn't changed in the way we do it at all since the 1860s. My go-to handbook was published in 1901 the handbook on fo treatise on photogravure. And uh, so anyway, that's what connects us uh, as artists to traditions and that's what I'm really interested in, the tools and the methods and stuff like that. But taking it into the contemporary world, I'm going to get on my Instagram feed and show you some stuff. <laughs> How many people do Instagram? Everybody probably, not everybody. Hey, that's good. How many people don't do Instagram or don't have a smartphone? See, that's crazy. So like, um, the artists I work with these days, and let's see how, how let's find out how uh, slow or fast this is going to be if it's... How does that look? Okay, we can see it. So, uh, that's a woodcut. So anyway, I continue to invite artists to come into my studio, right? That's a woodcut. You know what I mean? So that's no different from what Dürer would have done, carving into wood and printing in relief. On really nice Japanese Kozo paper, that's about four by four feet. The artist is named Jeff Rasher. He's one of the top tattooers in the city and in the country, and he works at Blackheart Tattoo. And um, so he carved that block, brought it to me, and uh, I, we printed it for him in an edition of 20. That's what they look like on the wall. 
as my assistants are printing and my interns. I don't do the, well, I shouldn't say I don't do the printing anymore, but uh, I try to get other people to do it. <laughs> and usually for free. <laughs> so if you want to come learn how to print and work for free, let me know. That's, uh, that's the side of my building and we're putting up for this conference last, printmaking conference last March, uh, we put up this uh, nice big print by Swoon. That's a linoleum block. And it printed on like um, butcher paper and just wheat pasted on the wall of my building. You all know Swoon, the street artist? So Swoon is somebody who started in printmaking. And now, I mean, now she's a worldwide sensation for all the stuff she does, but she started out carving linoleum blocks and printing those. I've worked a lot with Swoon. She works, she prints those in her studio by stamping on them with her feet. Uh, I mean, she doesn't anymore. She has a lot of, she has people working for her now too, of course. But um, let's see, this might be a movie. Let's see. Okay, so that's a nice big piece of Japanese mulberry paper, handmade, coming off the plate. That's a etching, copper plate etching. So that's by this local artist who works in San Jose named Horitomo. And uh, the prints look like that. Oh, sorry, get rid of that. Two cats, they're about three feet tall, one foot wide, etchings. Also using the gravier process, so in this case, the artist drew on a piece of mylar and we transferred the positive to copper plate using this 19th century technique, photogravier. And uh, that allows us, that allows the artist freedom to work on the mylar first and then when the plates are done, he can go back in and he can spit bite, like up in here, with nitric acid. He can dry point, he can scrape and burnish. Um, these aren't the wildest. Um, this is Instagram, so it's not the greatest photo, but I brought the prints. If you swing by the print department during the demo, I'll show them to you. They're printed on really nice handmade paper, by a, handmade by a living national treasure in Japan. Living National Treasure, meaning he's the one person who makes this specific kind of paper for seven generations, and the emperor designated him an important cultural property to continue this tradition. And the family's still doing it. But he passed away in August at the age of 91. But I have a bunch of his paper, and that's the kind of paper I use. Um, super uh, beautiful, not wildly expensive, but there are, think, printmakers, Think of all the papers you can use coming out of Japan and, and for all the Koreans and Chinese and Southeast Asians in the room, it's not only Japan, like all the great paper came from China, obviously, through Korea to Japan. And I, now these days, I use a lot of Chinese paper. And if I can get my hands on it, Korean paper. And all this really beautiful paper. And I know like a lot of the Asian students, they come from, a lot of students I've had, they come from Asia and they don't know anything about this paper and they found it, find out about the paper from me and then I had a couple of students, I'm like, when they went back to China, I'm like, bring back some paper. So they, they bring me all this paper, it's great. And they're like, wow, we never knew about Chinese paper before. So it's pretty cool. That's what I like to, that's what I like to do. Uh, this, uh, not, not order paper from students. What I like to do is I like to use traditional materials, you know. Uh, let's see if this will come up. That's, uh, do y'all know Don Ed Hardy, the tattoo artist? Um, you know, Ed Hardy clothing, that's the same guy. That was a little burp in his career, but he started out as a printmaker. He has a shop in San Francisco called Tattoo City. He's one of the, he's the godfather of American tattooing. And despite what you think about the clothing line, which has come and gone. He is, he is really amazing. When you think of Japanese tattooing and the influence of Japan in the tattoo world on America, that's all through 
Ed Hardy. He was like one of the first people, he was the first people to start corresponding with Sailor Jerry. And then Hardy went to Japan in the 70s and brought all this stuff back and well now it's like global. But anyway, we had a little exhibition of his work in January, in December, or when was that? October maybe? I don't remember. Uh, last year, and he called it Art Goes Ape. And that's a, that's a letterpress poster we put out. Um, any questions, just shout out. I'm sorry for the back and forth. I'm just showing you some of my, you know, what do you call it? I don't have any stories to tell, but. Okay, that's good. So that's Hardy right there. He always dresses really well. He's a very educated guy. He's in his, he was born in 1945, so whatever that makes him. Um, but I published some print, I worked with him for a long time. And I published some prints with him and uh, we just did a series of etchings. So that's him in my studio spit biting. So you take an aqua tint plate and you've got nitric acid that he's brushing on there to make it look like watercolor. And he was, he started out in printmaking. He got his degree in printmaking at the Art Institute like in 1968. And uh, then got a full ride to go do his graduate degree at Yale and said, nah, forget it. And he said, I want to be a tattooer. And he started tattooing. So he passed up graduate uh, program at Yale to become a tattooer. But his first love is printing, printmaking. And he's a really good, he knows his way around a print studio. Anyway, check out his work. It's really great. Um, that's, uh, he did, he hand painted these prints that we published. And when he was painting in the color, I took a picture of his hands because I just love the way he holds the brushes. He's a real, he, he really knows there he is painting them. This is at the L London Tattoo Convention in, in September. And he's painting them and they're like, the booth is packed with like 100 people watching him do that. It, it was really, really crazy. That's one of the prints. It's a little etching, about 8 by 10 inches. That's another one. That's another one of those Jeff Rashers. Somewhere in here, Uh, let me find it. Are there any questions? <laughs> no, somewhere in here I have a picture of him tattooing me. <laughs> anyway, there's some more of my, there's some more of those ukiyo-e masks. I don't have any pictures of my cats or food on, actually I do have one, oh, that one in the upper right hand corner, see, I mean right there that little uh, movie, that is of my cat. Uh, I'm not going to show it because it was about 10 minutes after he died and it was, uh, it's very, it's a beautiful little film but it's too distressing so. Um, I won't bore you too much longer, but let me just see what else I got. That's a bunch of that stuff I was just showing you. This is why I'm here today, I guess, to talk about this stuff. I, I don't know. I'm going to do a little demonstration. We're going to do like two hours of demonstrations, I guess, on Shinkole using Japanese papers and stuff like that. But this is a, a big etching by an artist named Sandal Burke. It's about uh, four feet wide and five feet tall. And it's, it's a gravure again. So, but it's like a line drawing of an imaginary monument, it's called. Um, that um, Sandow's a painter in LA. He riffs on historical images and he's riffing off of Durer and stuff in the, in the 1500s and 1600s. They had big, big prints in Europe. 
And Durer did a big, giant print called the Triumphal Arch of Maximilian. And uh, Burke riffed off of that to do these monuments. And so we turned them into etchings. We have two of them, one to the Constitution, one to the Declaration of Human Rights. And it's on four copper plates, uh, printed on handmade gompi, and then seamed together and backed twice and dried on drying boards. So at my studio, what we're doing is taking these Japanese methods of scroll mounting techniques and kind of pushing the limits of contemporary printmaking and making larger and larger prints. Sandow Burke and I did a series of 15 woodcuts that are four by eight feet each. And um, so we couldn't get paper big enough, so we print it on, in tiles and then we put it together, then we back it with another sheet of kozo and then, and then dry it on boards and stuff. It's, it's really complicated, but I just wanted to touch on it a little bit. Um, if you ever go to Catherine Clark Gallery over here on Utah Street, check out his work. Uh, he's a really good painter. So that's what I'm talking about. I, I, work, I didn't mention that. The, the artists I work with are not necessarily um, printmakers. They are painters, sculptors, musicians, things like that, you know? Um, let's see. I'm trying to find the picture of Hardy tattooing me, just because it's kind of funny. There's my cat. So I have one picture of my cat before he died, and then one picture shortly after his death. This kind of what else we got? Oh. So it's a little hard to see, but this is, uh, if you suss out Sandow Burke, it's B-I-R-K. There's a series of these woodcuts I mentioned called The Depravities of War. And they're based on Callot's work, Jacques Callot, who was uh, uh, an engraver and etcher in the 1400s and 1500s. And this is one of the prints, four by eight feet woodcut on Kozo. And in the background are the Constitution prints. Um, so it's really, this is the, it's really kind of boring to watch somebody talk about his Instagram feed, I apologize. This is what the copper plates look like. This is one I just finished yesterday. So. Um, I talked about black heart tattoo. Um, the other person who works there is uh, Tim Lehigh. So this is the plate. Um, this is the gravier plate with the carbon tissue on it just before it's etched in ferric chloride. And that's the original painting that he did on very thin kozo that I turned into a transparency by just shellacking it. So if you guys are working with silk screen or or photogravure if you get into it, or any sort of photo process, you can think about taking really thin paper, and as you're positive, you can, you can use that to draw on, and then if you shellac it, it makes it transparent. And that works as a good positive for screen printing. Or I'm, I've never tried it with litho plates, but I'm sure it would work. Uh, you just have to screw around with the exposure a little bit, because you do have a little bit of translucency in that base film, but that's what we do. We just Rather than have the artist work on clear mylar, which is really hard with wet media, because he works with sumi ink, like just regular uh, ink and brush, you just brush it on onto a copper plate. I mean, pardon? What's that? What paper are you specifically using? Uh, it's called sekishu, and it's a really thin kozo, but it's roll made. It's the stuff that I have in my studio. But anything you can. Get, mulberry works better than gompi, just the thinnest mulberry you could find, because gompi doesn't as, absorb the water quite as well, it buckles and stuff, and then you have to shellac it really well. 
I don't know, in screen printing, if you take positives and you oil them with baby oil or something and use that, it's the same idea, except you don't have oil all over everything all the time. It gets really greasy and nasty. And, and besides, on this, in this process, I can't use oil because the, the paper has to touch the gravure tissue, and it can't be greasy at all because then it has to adhere to a copper plate. It's a really, really hard and arduous process, which I was talking to Carrie Ann about. We, she's interested in starting it here, which I think would be a really cool idea. It's great for photographers. That's a really cool etching that's about 20 inches uh, by 20 inches by Mary Joy. That's a hard ground etching that's been hand painted. Mary Joy um, is a tattoo artist who works at Hardy's studio in San Francisco. This is uh, Ed Hardy's son, Don Hardy, and this is a letterpress poster we did. Not poster, a set of edition prints. <laughs> That's a really classic tattoo design. So I have letterpress at my studio, silk screen, all the stuff. That's what those things of mine look like on the wall. That's about four by four feet. And that's, those gold panels are the antique gold leaf I told you about. And I just silk screen that image right over the top of it. That's a sweet little etching by a tattoo artist named Steve Boltz in uh, New York. Smith Street tattoo. This is a former student of mine at the Art Institute who's working on a woodblock print that's however big that is. It's about eight feet tall and 10 feet wide or something. Uh, so he just draws on these big panels of, uh, of wood, and then he carves, and then he uses the blue to um, figure out more shading. And he goes along, works that way. Um, this is a classic. That's Ed Hardy from 1964, a, a hard ground drawing he did in school. So all you print, and that's another Hardy, for, again, from like 1964. So all you printmakers who have your plates, don't throw them away. Just wrap them up and hang on to them, because in 30 or 40 years, uh, you never know. You pull them out, you're like, wow. He, d he found these in storage. He didn't even know he had them. And he gave them to me, and we printed them and editioned them. That's the beauty of it. It's like, uh, you know, it, it, people are still pr printing off of Rembrandt plates and stuff like that. It, it lasts forever, you know? I mean, we won't have our own websites in five years. Where will Instagram be? All this digital shit in our life? Forget about it. So it's kind of cool. When you're an etcher, that's a, another Mary Joy little hard ground etching, hard ground aqua tint. That's that big Sandal Burke print. Sorry, going a little fast. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up. This gives you a scale, a size of scale. That's Mary Joy making corrections on her plate. There's my poor dead cat. <laughs> oh, I have a pretty funny story. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, so anyway, yeah, now we're getting into the old stuff. There's Howardy tattooing my first tattoo on my arm, a tiger. That's really, that w he stopped tattooing a long time ago. But we did a series of prints in Japan in 1995 uh, called The Mysterious East. That was one of them. That was like, uh, it's a four color etching. Really cool. That's, this is the plate for it coming out of the acid bath. So you've got that is the background plate for that. That's my tiger. 
My grandfather started Maloney Printing. That's what I call my studio now. And this was a, a, one of, a press that he had made for him in like 1918 or something like that. A big giant offset press. What's that? It's an offset press. It's like your, the plate. That's my studio when we're additioning or proofing. You can see all the prints on the wall. Oh, so let's see. So do you know, you guys know, so that's Hardy and on the right, you guys know Horiyoshi the third, right? Well, maybe anyone who's in the tattoo world and is interested in Japanese tattooing, that's, that's him on the left, Horiyoshi the third. He's, you know, he's part of the reason this whole craze happened. But it, look at those guys. So that's Smith Street Tattoo. And they were in my, uh, that's Bert on the, le on the right and Eli on the left. And um, th those guys are, uh, those guys have been in the studio like two weeks working. And I snapped this picture. <laughs> and then one of their friends, look at that, Dan goes, San Quentin Art Class? Great social work. <laughs> And I, I said, yeah, it's very rewarding and touching to see how art can help change these men's lives. <laughs> and then Bert Crack wrote, fully sussed, because everybody who knows me knows I use the word sussed a lot. It's like suss it out, get it sussed. But then some poor woman wrote in, really? About the jail's art class? I want to do that. I already work inside the jail. Oh, I already work inside the jail. Was it hard to get in? <laughs> So it's like random lurker. I'm like, oh, sorry about that. We're just joking with each other. Uh, San Quentin art class. Look at those guys. Uh, they're, they're the most awesome guys, and they're super talented artists. And um, my, my studio is in the Mission, and it's right, it's right on tree between 22nd and 24th, 22nd, 23rd, and we have the door rolled up, and you know, it's a really nice residential neighborhood with you know, fourth generation Mexican family across the street, and you know, it's really like typical um, mission, right? But along with the mission, all the shit that goes down and stuff, there's a lot of tagging on my building and stuff, and then these guys were hanging around for like uh, two weeks, and after that, no one tagged me anymore. It's like. <laughs> My street cred was just like way up here. No, they've left me alone ever since. They'd be, and, and, the, and the taco truck down the street on Treat and 20 Seconds, the best taco truck in the mission, um, they nearly ran out of food because there were four of these guys and they eat a lot of tacos. <laughs> and then like the, the ice cream guy w went by, you know, and the bell's going off and they're like, oh, ice cream, and they'd stop him every day, you know. <laughs> I'm like, it, I was in that studio for a year. It never dawned on me to like buy some ice cream. And then, anyway, it just went on and on. So um, they're not as bad as they look. They're sweet guys. So I'm going to stop there. If anyone has any questions, I'm sorry for the back and forth and stuff, but I just kind of wanted to free it up. Yeah. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about the collaborative process? So yeah. I know where it comes from you and says, I have this crazy idea to do eight foot, you know, photo reviewers. Yeah. How does that process evolve? Yeah, well, right. So Sando and I have done a lot of projects. And, and um, it started out with a series of etchings about this big. And then that was kind of his idea. Uh, then I invited him back. And this was in Hawaii. And he was looking at these Kalo prints, uh, which are the miseries of war. And they influence Goya, uh, Goya's uh, um, the disasters of war, right? If you look at. Goya's work, and then look back at Calo's, you can see a lot of that stuff coming out. And he's like, I want to make a series of prints based on Calo's uh, 15 etchings from the 1500s. And they're about this big. So it was, it was I who said, let's go big. And he's like, yeah, that would be cool. I'm like, let's make woodcuts. So we're just like back and forth and riffed on it. And then so he made drawings about this big. So he uses the composition of the Calos, each of them. So if you um, well, go online and go to Sandow Burke's thing and look at, the, look at the prints. But anyway, there's a book we published too. But anyway, so he'll take Calos. Uh, uh, this isn't answering your question. I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. 
It's a lot of back. It's a lot of back and forth. He took Callot's composition of like burning, burning churches and stuff of the Fifty Years' War, um, back in whatever that was, a long time ago. Um, they were published in the 1500s. So, and then he takes that composition and he'll take out the church and he'll make it a mosque. So this was in the this was during the Iraq invasion. So he did these prints that turned into this comment on the Iraqi invasion and the Iraq war. But all the compositional elements are there, including the little dogs and stuff. If you look at Callot, there's always a dog like licking his behind, or you know, or there'll be two dogs copulating and stuff. So Sandow takes all that stuff, puts it in, but it's all American soldiers and all that. And we like make it bigger and bigger and bigger. So he did drawings about this big, and we literally just took them down to Kinko's, blew them up, tiled them together with just regular copy paper, got big birch plywood, <clears throat> you know, quarter inch, no, no, uh, half inch birch ply, and pasted the drawings. We flipped them in the copier and then pasted the drawings directly on the board and shellacked them so they wouldn't rip and shred. And we got a bunch of interns from RISD in over the course of a year and we just gave them Dremel tools and routers and they just <laughs> routed the shit out of it. And then we printed it on these big sheets of paper. That's how Sandow and I work. And then he wanted to do this thing based on Durer's Arch of Maximilian, using the Constitution as this architectural edifice with the entire Const United States Constitution written out on it, with all these drawings commenting on the state of the Union. And we were going to make the drawing was 10 by 12 feet, the same as Durer's print. And I'm like, okay, we can totally make an etching out of that. Let's just like tile it together. Durer's are like 109 or 190 blocks this big, pasted together. So it's like, we'll just paste together a bunch of etchings. It's going to be easy. And his gallery said, no, 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 no. We can never sell a print that large. There's not plexi enough for it. So she's like, let's scale it back. And we're like, okay, make it four by five feet. So we scan the drawing. Uh, transferred it to film, scaled it down, and made gravier plates. And then, so it's a lot of back and forth. It's my crazy, uh, craziness combined with what he's willing to do. With these guys, they had never done etchings before. So I just bring out soft ground plates, and it's like, here, draw on it. You know? And tattoo artists are great, because it's just like etching or a lot of printmaking. It's all line and shade. So you've got your hard line, whether it's soft ground or dry point or, or hard ground. And then the shading is the aqua tint. So they pick up on it right away. It's like, oh, yeah, I can do that. So it's like, just hand them a plate. They draw on it. And, can, and they're like, next, next, next. And then, and then they choose all the colors and stuff. And all the, you can see that they're working on little things on the wall while we're etching the big plates. They, they were big plates, 18 by 20. In, the case, in this case, there was a publisher who publishes prints by tattoo artists. He came to me through another guy, Martin Mazora of Cannonball Press. Martin's like, you got to talk to Paul. He can do it. Um, so somebody else put up the money, because it's a lot of money to have four guys come from New York, be in the studio for a week, and the amount of food they eat, <laughs> and, and matched with the amount of copper we use. And then you have to sell them. you know. And then, and, uh, the marketing part, I'm not so fond of, so I, that's why I don't have a website. So in that case, somebody else put up the money, but he was hands off. He's like, here's the printer, here's the, here are the artists, show me what you got. In the case of Sandow Burke, his, in Sandow Burke, he has a collector who put up the money. So uh, see, I used to publish, but it's too risky. It's a good way to lose money really fast. And I don't like to do contract printing. I don't do printing where so much where people come to me and like, can you just print this? It's like, that's the biggest headache in the world. I want to have some control. It is a collaboration. But Sandow Burke, we go to his big collector. We're like, can you give us the money for this project? Which is a lot. I don't want to tell you how much it is, but it's a lot of money. And um, they're like, sure. <clears throat> they lend us the money. We do the project, sell the prints, and then they, in the sale of the prints, the first several prints or however many it takes, they get their money back. And then they get two proofs for their collection, because they collect his work. And it'll, it'll all go to a major museum one day. I mean, they're huge collectors. So, so there's that. There are different ways you can think about funding these things. If you're in your business practices class, figure it out. <laughs> or you know, um, crowdfunding or whatever. But it takes a lot of money, as you know. And when you get out of school, you're not going to have all this equipment to work with and stuff. So you have to figure out, how can we make this work? 
with printmaking, it's hard. You need a press. It usually takes a group of people to get a press together, but it's possible. It's not a solitary, uh, a solitary practice as in painting or other things or photography, as you all know. It's like ceramics, you know? Ceramics, it takes a whole village to fire a kiln, you know? Traditionally, you need the people to cut the wood and, 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 and you need the people to watch the kiln for, you know, five days. Like, well, I'm talking about in Asia, you know? So, but it's the same in America, I mean in Europe. But so that's why around ceramics and printmakings, you always have groups or collectives. So think about that when you leave school. It's like, how can we put together a little collective, get a, a shitty little studio somewhere, buy a press and start doing this stuff? Uh, no, I started out in photography in school, and then I dropped out of school, and I went to Crown Point Press and got a job, and became a master printer. But I, uh, um, <laughs> so I'm not the best person to talk to about uh, getting an MFA, but uh, or maybe I am. But uh, it, it hasn't been hard, but it hasn't been easy. But I was always interested in it. My grandfather was a printer, and an artist, and my father was a newspaper publisher. So graphic arts were always in my blood and in my senses. You know, the tactile, the tactility of printmaking, the smell of the inks and all that, I grew up with that. The paper, the sound of the presses. So yeah, um, but no, I started out in photography, which I still love. And um, it's harder and harder in San Francisco to survive as an artist, so. I'm kind of stationed in Portland right now, but um, I'm going to keep my studio, but uh, not but. I'm keeping my studio, and it's, it's good. We're, we'll have exhibitions this summer and stuff. Uh, I don't know why I ended on those two guys, but uh, <laughs> uh, Bert tattooed me there, and other guy Steve Boltz tattooed me there. And, um, um, uh, so it's not all tattoo artists. I work with other kinds of artists, too. But, anything else? <laughs> um, what about the difference between how your own personal shop is run and versus working at Crown Point? Oh, yeah, well, it's a completely different. Um, you know, I mean, for one thing, um, being a full time printer at a place like Crown Point is really hard um, because you're there. Um, eight hours a day. They work four days a week, but you know it's like intense printing all day long. Like I said, it'll take months to edition something, and it's boring as hell, you know. And it's a great job and a, a good career, and you meet all kinds of great artists. But after a few years at, uh, of that, I'm like, I don't even have my own studio practice. So, as printers, as printmakers, as you go out of school, you have to think about, well, do I want to work in a shop? where the last thing you want to do on Friday night is go and do your own work, right? It's like you don't want to see an etching studio for another three days. So you don't, for me personally, I didn't, my studio practice suffered. But you speak of collaboration. Crown Point Press doesn't consider what their printers do collaboration. They consider their printers to be technicians. So it's like we hand them the plate, they work on it, we etch it, we print it, and we put it on the wall and we stand back. <coughs> and we let the artists work it out. It's a really great situation for an artist, but they don't say, well, what do you think of the red? You know, should it be more red? Or, or you don't jump in and say, well, that, that umbrella is in a really bad place. I mean, we don't, we don't collaborate that way. So, but in my shop, I collaborate more. I mean, I don't, like I said, with Sandow, he's like, let's do this. I'm like, let's do this, you know, and then, well, how is that gonna work? I'm, and I, I say, well, I'm gonna get this kind of paper and make it work. Uh, it's more of, I don't see myself as a technician anymore as much as a, a collaborator, 50%. Of, no, I wouldn't say 50%. It's still their work. My chop goes on it. It's got my signature style, but you don't have that at Crown Point Press. Crown Point Press has a signature style, but not an individual style of any one printer. Well, you know what I mean? Is that clear? Yeah, and a lot of shops work that way. It's the, the anonymous craftsman, you know, that you also, I keep speaking of, the, of Asia, but that you also have in Japan where you have these people making no mask or kimonos or ceramics. They never have their name on those things. Um, it's the same with printers in the West or even the East. If you look at ukiyo-e printing, you have carvers, 
you know, the, he, the Hokusai prints and all that stuff, Toyokuni, all that stuff. It took teams of people to make those. The artist didn't do anything. The artist gave a, would give a sketch of Mount Fuji and say, here. And they would take the sketch, and teams of carvers would carve all the blocks, and they'd hand them off to teams of printers who printed them all. There was no crossover, and the publisher put up all the money. Um, so it's the anonymous craftsman like that. As a printer, in studios like Crown Point Press and stuff, no one will ever remember your name, and you've got to get used to it. It's okay, you know, but it's different. Um, it's, it's very rewarding. Uh, but as, as I get older, I just can't do it anymore because my elbow and shoulder is... <laughs> so I prefer teaching. <laughs> but yeah, there's that. Um, was it through Crown Point Press that you got into the direct review or photo review? Like, when did you switch it? Because I feel like I don't hear about that as a process as often. Yeah. Uh, what was it that sparked that for you? Because I know you do a lot of it now. Yeah, well, Gravier was just starting at Crown Point Press when I was there. And, and the person who was doing it was Lothar Osterberg, who's one of the top Gravier printers in the country. And he has a studio in Brooklyn. So they had never done direct Gravier until kind of recently. And it has, so when did I get into it? I was on the periphery of that at, at Crown Point Press in the early 90s. And then when I had my, sh I ran a studio in Hawaii. I invited Lothar to come out, and I really got into photogravure, and I really started doing direct gravure, and more and more people are doing it now as a way of, uh, as, a me as an economic means, I think. Crown Point Press is doing it a lot now, too, because they work with Wayne Thiebaud. They worked with him for 50 years. Do you all know Wayne Thiebaud? He lives in Sacramento. He's one of the, you know, Bay Area figure. Of, he's a great guy, 95 years old, a major educator, too. Every, you run into people all the time who are his students, but anyway, he can't come down for two weeks anymore, uh, and he's, he's old, you know? So they send him mylars, and he draws on them, and they make the plates. And then he'll, uh, they'll make the key image, and then he'll come in and scrape and burnish dry point and add colors. So that's kind of why I got into, that's another reason I use Gret Gravier more and more. It's like I worked with Carrie Ann, so you see her, you'll see her images that we did in my studio. Um, it's hard to just like take a plate and start doing spit bite and get what the tonal range that she wanted. You can get it all sussed out on mylar first and transfer it to plate. It sounds easy, but it's not. It's really hard to get the exposure right. It's not like photolitho, or you just you don't, or I'm not disparaging photolitho or silkscreen. It's not like you plug it in and it works. You know, it's it's really hard to expose through frosted mylar and get the tonal range, but. I did the same thing with these guys because despite the fact I said they're really good at drawing and stuff, they had a hard time with, sh with uh, soft ground. Uh, it took them like two days to get that tr soft ground drawing transferred to plate. And the second project we did, uh, the four guys from Brooklyn, I had them, I sent them mylar, big mylar, and they did the key drawings first. So um, you take the outline of the panther, send it to me, I get it on plate, then they come and then they add a bunch of shit to it, like dry point and everything else. So that's why I do direct revere. It's a mainly to be able to speed up the project and get stuff on plate. In this day and age when artists don't have time to spend in the studio, it's kind of sad. In the old days, the standard project was two weeks straight at Crown Point Press, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. But artists, they have so much going on in their lives, they won't commit two weeks anymore. They'll come out for five days. So sometimes you have to start with the plates ahead of time. But it's not cheating. It's, it's not a reproduction. Because the beauty of the etching is like you hand them the plate and you can go back in and work it. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. It's time to stand up and get some air. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.